I, mean, I am genuine. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it. Sorry, Gator fans. I was going to say something, but it's going to sound patronizing, and it wasn't meant to be, but we'll just go. Okay. So if you are new here, uh, we, and there's a reason for this. We typically just work through a book of the Bible at a time. We've gone through all sorts of fun stuff. For quite some time now, we've been in the book of Acts, which just stands for the actions of the apostles. It's written by a guy named Luke. If you've been around, you know, and probably can even repeat the words after me. He was a doctor turned investigative journalist, all true, hired by a guy named Theophilus, who was a, probably a Roman official, and he hires Luke to go and investigate whether or not Jesus is actually God's son, right, and whether or not we could trust him. And so there's a reason we just kind of open up the word and work through it verse by verse, and some of that is, really candidly, I have nothing good to offer you. I really don't. For the first couple years as a pastor or church planner, our church grew really fast, but I a couple years into it, I was looking into it and going, I'm not sure if it was our clever creative team or if it was God, right? And so God doesn't say my clever analogies and cute quotes or anybody else's doesn't return void. It's just his word. And so uh, one of the ways to guard against me- not messing that up is just going, okay, we're just going to work through it. And we've been working through it for a while now. This is week 26 or 27. We've got a few more weeks. We'll wrap up at the end of November and start an Advent series on December 3rd. So we're, we're, we're moving right along. And so reminder, Luke was an investigative journalist who basically spent years, if not a decade, to go and research Jesus. In fact, he uh, talked to eyewitnesses, read uh, as much written documents as he could find, went and listened to the local pastors, and tells us in the Gospel of Luke, that's kind of volume one of the book of Luke and then Acts, that he writes all this so that we can have certainty of the things we've been taught. And so the neat thing about this, he writes the Gospel of Luke, explaining who Jesus is, basically the biography of Jesus' life, and then he continues with kind of the first century church. And what we've seen now for, you know, more than four or five months is that there's this kind of this pattern. We see it first with Luke and kind of been the goal for us here, right? The pattern is this, that people move from spectator, spectator, that's a loud motorcycle fellow wonder, uh, spectator, right? Uh, that means just kind of observing, watching along, Luke was just spectating, to participator, meaning joining in. That's why I love the Gospel of Luke and then the book of Acts. As Luke trans, uh, he kind of transforms from talking about they's and them's and he's and she's and instead starts using words like we. In other, word, Luke, in other words, Luke gets so confident in this that he actually joins in. Now, here's what happens when you join him. You can't help. You can't help from moving from spectator to participator. And when you finally get in on that, when you get in on that, you can't help but be a disciple maker, meaning when you start to live the life Jesus has for you, then everything changes for you, for your family, for your neighbors, all those things. This is the pattern that you see in scriptures and in real life. So the goal has been, hey, could we have the courage, that's what is necessary, to actually participate? And today we're going to see one more time that where kind of the, the obstacle to that is, and it's just fear, and we're going to see it with some guys in the scriptures today, well-to-do, and powerful people, governors in the Roman Empire who just aren't going to be able to make that leap. So the goal, what I've been praying all week for us, is that we would have the courage to join him. And here's what I've said over and over again. I promise you guys, I promise you, I can't promise you much. I can't promise you much. But I promise you, on your first day of 2024, your first day in heaven, you will not regret finally joining in and participating. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 24. But there's a lot to kind of catch up on. And so last week what we saw is we saw Paul, who's now been in uh, kind of in... Uh, captivity for, uh, it's only been 12 days, but it's been three weeks for us. And so, um, what, what, kind of the big idea last week, I think it's really important we get this as Christians, is sometimes, okay, we see this with Paul, sometimes Jesus delivers us out of our circumstances. That's what we all want. God, would you fix my cancer? Would you heal my marriage? Would you fix my finances? Would you help me keep my job? Would you make sure my family's healthy? We, we have messes in our life, and sometimes God comes in and just radically transforms them, which is... God's glory, and in some ways, many of us have experienced that. But most of the times, and this is what I think us pastors have not done a good job doing, we tell you to pray the prayer, ask Jesus in your heart, and then it's all just puppies and rainbows. And, it's, and you know that. It's just not puppies and rainbows. So sometimes, sometimes God delivers us out of our circumstances. But most, you understand that, so I, don't, I can't put percentages on it, but sometimes it's a lot less than most. So the majority of the time, God doesn't deliver us out of our circumstances. Jesus doesn't deliver us out of our circumstances most of the time. He meets us in our circumstances. So the big question we got to ask is, where is Jesus at in the middle of our circumstances? So for those of us who are Christ followers, really important question. For those of you who aren't, right, which really, really glad you're here with us today, maybe it's worth considering, is God real? Can we trust him? And you're going to see this really neat moment happen for this guy named Paul. Now remember, Paul 
is now in captivity. It's really, really neat. In the, in the last the last passage, Paul is in the jail cell, and as he's there, it says Jesus comes and meets with him, stands beside him, and reminds him that he's going to actually share this message again in Rome. You know, we're going to go on this journey with Paul where he's going to stay in captivity, and it's going to be multiple years, which is really good news because Paul's going to be kind of transferred to another place, as we're going to see this week, and then he's going to be on ships and all sorts of places. There's going to be shipwrecks. He's going to be on an island, all sorts of mess. But the whole time, Paul has this, this, this reminder that Jesus came and met him in the middle of the circumstances and made a promise to him that one day he would actually stand before Rome. So no matter what's happening, he does, all the pain and all the sorrow, he knows that Jesus is there with him, and he knows that things are going to eventually end up in Rome. So all, the, all along the way, he has some courage, right? Because this is what Jesus says to him. He says, take courage, take courage, and Jesus stood by him. So Paul was in the middle of this moment where he hears these things, and then it doesn't get better for a little while. What happens next is uh, Paul is then going to have this guy named Claudius, he's a tribune, who's going to basically say, hey, I don't know what to do for you, but I can't fix any of this, so what I'm going to do is we're going to send you to a governor named Felix, and we're going to write this letter, and you're going to show up there, and you're going to be tried there. So he's now, uh, he's made all the Jewish people mad, where he's been beaten once, he's then been kind of put in captivity, and then he presents kind of his perspective, his truth, all those things, which is God's truth, to the Sanhedrin, the, the Jewish officials, and then they want to beat him again. The first time it's because he says Gentiles, meaning God's for all people. The second time he says resurrection, which means you actually, there is life after death, and people just get really, really angry. This leader, Claudius, the tribune, goes, I don't know what to do. So he writes a letter, and he sends Paul with 200 plus people on this caravan on horse to go to the next town to meet with the governor named Felix. And so he's going to get to Felix today going to have this letter that's basically going to say, hey, um, Paul's in trouble. There's going to be some people that are going to present some evidence to why he's in trouble, and you're going to have to make a decision about it. So we're going to find him now with Felix. Paul is still in handcuffs. This has been a prophecy that's been happening for quite some time, and so we're going to see it play out. Now, last week, last week, here's again the big idea. Sometimes Jesus delivers us out of our circumstances. Most of the time, he meets us in our circumstances. This Week's big idea, you'll recognize it if you know the Bible. It just comes straight from the scriptures, okay? Straight from the scriptures. It's going to be really, really nice. And you're going to see why in just a second. But here is today's big idea. You ready? This is Jesus' words. Paul already has some from him saying he's going to stand by him. This is John chapter 14, verse 6. This is what Jesus says in his last discourse before he's about to be arrested, then brutally beaten, then humiliated, then die on a Roman cross, and then come back to life, proven that he was God. He says this to his disciples. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one, see that? No one comes to the Father except through me. So we're going to see some really important stuff today that has to do with these three words. And here's the good news. Here's the good news. If you're a Christ follower, are you ready to join in or consider it? Really good news, guys. The truth is really on our side here. The truth is really on our side. And it certainly seems like it's not. It certainly seems like the world is chaos and there's all these relative truths. But the truth, the truth that Jesus says, and by the way, the truth is not just some idea. The truth is a person. His name is Jesus. The truth is on our side. And why that matters today is, I don't know, I, the kind of shows I like are the uh, new bad guy every week. You know what I'm talking about? Like if there's a, if you, you when I watch a show, I don't, I don't want to follow a plot line of who's dating who and who upset who. And, and I, don't, I need, at the beginning of the show, there to be a bad guy. And at the end of the show, I need, I need justice to happen for the bad guy, right? So just give me, whether it's 25 minutes or 55 minutes, I just need it all resolved in one week. I, don't, I can't keep up with all the different plot lines. So if you're like, like Lost or any of those shows, I mean, I don't. It's just way too much to me. In fact, I will stop watching a show the minute they insert all this like relational drama. I'm like, nope, need a new bad guy, and I need justice to happen. That's why I love Law and Order, CSI. By the way, I, I didn't like CSI when we first started watching it, but then I got an HD TV, and now I feel like I'm really good at solving it, right? I just needed a high definition to understand what's going on, but I need a new bad guy every single week, right? And the, the shows I like the most in this are... Um, are the law shows, you know what I'm talking about, where there's a lawyer, and there's an argument, and there's an investigator, all those kind of things, but, but again, it resolves 
every week. And so I like when the defense and the prosecution, they, def- they kind of present their evidence. And then there's the investigator in the background going to track down some more stuff. Like, I love those shows. And if you like those shows, this is pretty neat. Because this is essentially what's going to happen today. Paul is going to be sent <laughs> to Felix, this governor who's also going to be the judge. And first, the prosecution is going to present its evidence. And going to explain why Paul should be murdered, killed, you know, thrown in a dungeon. And then Paul, brilliant Paul, is going to then give his defense. So if you like these shows, that's all that's happening here in this moment. So where we find them right now, Felix is about to uh, listen. And who's going to talk is actually going to be this guy named Tertullus. Tertullus, which is interesting, is the, the Roman word which means third. And he is like a third of the story here, so that, that's helpful. Tertullus is a lawyer. He's a, so if you see it like in Suits or one of those shows, this is a hot shot lawyer. But what's interesting is he is a lawyer who knows, we, we can assume that he knows the Roman law really well. Because it's not just going to be him, there's also going to be Ananias, who's going to be the high priest, who's going to travel with Tertullus to present this evidence. We saw him last week where Paul, uh, he has, he's the one who gets Paul to get punched in the mouth, and then Paul kind of responds to him. So we got two really, really hot shots. This guy is the Roman legal expert. This guy here, Ananias, is the Jewish you know, legal expert. So they're going to present their evidence, and then Paul's going to respond. So let's see what happens. This is Acts chapter 24, beginning in verse 1. Here's what it says. Several days later, Felix, I'm sorry, let me get, I'm just starting there, all the wrong part. Acts chapter 24, verse 1. Five days later, okay, so he's on the way, has the letter. Felix is now ready to hear this. It says this. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus, and they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. So Felix is here. They've traveled. Paul has arrived. And now five days later, Ananias and Tertullus, real people in history, right, are now going to present this to Felix. Now, Felix... You can find out all about him in Jewish history. He is not a Christ follower. He doesn't, it's the only place he shows up in the scriptures. But you know, outside the scriptures and other, other historical stuff, we find out that Antonius Felix, he was a slave, okay? He was a slave. His brother was a friend of the Roman emperor Claudius. And through such influence, brother convinces Claudius to allow him to be the governor of this area. He rose in status, first as a child gaining freedom, and then through intrigue, he became the first former slave to become a governor of a Roman province. Okay, so big deal guy here. Now, he's not a very good guy, right? Uh, what we can find out about his private life is this, that he traded his influence and indulged in every license and excess, thinking that the, uh, he could do any evil act with impunity. Now, so did lots of terrible stuff. In fact, he ordered a massacre of thousands of Jews in Caesarea with more Jewish homes looted by the Roman soldiers. So this guy over Caesarea, now Paul has been shipped there with all the soldiers. Now Ananias and Tertullus are here meeting with this guy, and he has no friend of the Jews. But this is interesting. He's about to talk to him. Watch what he says here. It's so good. It's just like straight out of a TV show. Uh, here's what it says next, uh, verse 2. When Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. So here he is, he's presenting his case. Now watch this. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you. Now remember, this is the guy that's massacred thousands of Jews, but this guy with his flattery is going, oh, you're the best, right? We've enjoyed a long period of peace under you. And your foresight has brought about reforms in the nation. I mean, he is puckered up here telling this guy all this great stuff. And he continues, everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this was a, with profound gratitude. Now, this is interesting. The word most excellent, some would say it's flattery. But more than likely, this is just a title for a Roman official. That's how we know Theophilus, the guy who funded all this research, uh, was probably a Roman official because Luke calls him most excellent. So the most excellent is this title, but everything else is just silly flattery now. Why is he doing this silly flattery? It's really, really simple, guys, because the truth is not on the side. The evidence is not on the side, right? And so if you're a lawyer, I'm not, but I watch all the shows, right? If, you, if the facts are on your side, you present the facts, right? If the evidence is on your side, you present the evidence. If neither one of those things are on your side, you create a bunch of confusion, kiss a lot of bottoms, and create 
straw men to, to argue against, right? So this guy is just telling him how great he is. He is not a good dude at all. Verse 4, it says this. But in order not to weary you further, O excellent Felix with the great haircut, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. You see this. You see the sliminess of it. Tertullus is presenting this. He's asking Felix. He's like, oh, we will be very, very brief. The reason you're going to be very brief is because you have absolutely no evidence. But hey, in your kindness, would you hear this? And now he's going to present the evidence. Again, there is none. The truth is not on their side. Verse 5, it says this. We have found this man, that's Paul, right? We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world, right? So, I mean, you're seeing even some exaggeration here. All over the world, everywhere. I mean, even in Alaska, which isn't going to be founded for 2,000 more years almost. He's stirring up trouble there, right? All over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect. Lots that we could talk about. You have to come to the bonus round if you want to hear this. Also, you're going to see in here, I'm going to jump directly from verse 6 to verse 8. There is no verse 7. It's in the KJV. But you've got to come on Tuesday if you want to hear more about that. Not really important for today. So if you didn't know, on Tuesdays, noon, we cover, uh, Sergeant Harris and I cover all this material again. Love for you to join us online, noon. Ask your questions. Or if you've got a question at time, Josh at fpcbarto.org. But they're basically saying, this guy, Paul, he's a cult leader. And he has stirred up trouble everywhere and even tried to desecrate the temple. I'm not sure, right? They even this fancy temple we have in Jerusalem, Paul is even disrespecting it. So we seized him. We had no choice. We didn't want to do it. He just is a really, really bad guy, and we're the good guys. And so we seized him. Uh, by examining him yourself, you, you hear this language? You will be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him. You hear this? I mean, this literally is just like a, this really is the opening you know, discussion in a, in a law firm. Hey, what you're going to see in, this law, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the trial, what you're going to see is that he's going to try to present his evidence that he's just like the Pharisees, but he is not one of the Pharisees, right? So he's going to say these things. So lots of exaggeration, lots of drama, and you see what he called him again? A plague. So he's saying, if you don't do something about this, Felix, all the world's going to end. He's going to destroy everything for the Jews, right? And you see he calls the Nazarene sect. This is... A couple things going on here. You've got Nazarites, which kind of follow John the Baptist, which follow Jesus. A complicated group of people who had lots of courage, who created some mess for the Roman Empire and for the Jewish leadership. And so he's basically saying, this guy is a cult leader. He's a cult leader. By the way, he's a cult leader of the Nazarenes. And, you know, this is, again, don't want to offend any of you, but he is literally, this is a pejorative. Every time you see the word Nazarene or Nazareth show up, it's literally like saying he is from Fort Meade. Got it? Got it? Sorry, I, I was going to say frostproof, and I'm like, I don't know that we have anybody in the room from frostproof. So, Bowling Green. I, anyway, so you, you got it, right? So, he is a cult leader, and what the defense is going to tell you is that he is a like a Pharisee, but he is not. He even tried to desecrate the temple. I don't know exactly what they're describing here, but that's what they're saying. So, verse 9, this is what it says. The other Jews joined in the accusation. Order, order in the court. You got it? This is what's going on here. Asserting that these things were true. Lots going on here, and everybody's kind of leaned in. They're like, yeah, kill him. He's the bad guy. That's verse 9. Now, when the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have been a judge over this nation, so I'll gladly make my defense. No flattery. No bottom kissing, and now he is going to, steal in handcuffs, present his evidence to Felix. Now again, the truth really is on his side. You see what it says here? I love this. You see, it literally says, I will cheerfully, cheerfully make my defense. Okay, he's been in handcuffs. He, now here's the good news. Remember, remember, he's already been promised by Jesus himself that he's going to make it to Rome. Caesarea is not Rome. So he knows that he's not about to die. So he has some confidence here that there will be a good day. That's why last week I wanted to read to you these promises that God makes everything work together for those who are called according to his purpose. That there will be no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow for us as Christ followers. So it will get better. This is a promise in the middle of hard times. And Jesus tells us in John chapter 16, verse 33, in this world you will have trouble. So Paul knows these things. But take heart or take courage or be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. And so Paul can stand here glad and cheerfully because he knows 
that the Lord is on his side and the truth is on his side. You know, I know the truth matters here. Watch verse 11. You can verify, verse 11, you can verify that no more than 12 days ago, I mean, again, it's taken us weeks to get through this, but just 12 days ago is when Paul shows up in Jerusalem, goes through this Nazarite vow, and while he's in the temple and doing nothing wrong, these Jews from Asia Minor get angry and come to beat him down, then all this mess happened. He goes, 12 days ago, you can find, but not more than 12 days ago, I went up to Jerusalem to worship. Let me tell you why I went. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogue or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. You see this? I love this. Because, I mean, literally, this is like a, one of these shows. He's going, look, the defense is going to, I mean, the prosecution is going to try to make up all the stuff. They're going to try to confuse you. And they're going to try to get the whole audience and the mob really, really angry. But listen, they cannot prove any of these charges that are brought up against me. In other words, the truth is on my side. And I, and I think about that. Again, it'll take us a little while to get all the way around the barn today. But I think about that. And, this is a really great video by Francis Chan that I watched this week. And I recommend you watching it. It's like 55 minutes. Interesting enough, last year in January, Francis as a pastor was in Simi Valley, and now kind of a house church pastor wrote Crazy Love. Brilliant guy. And I, you know, if you look at Ephesians 4, he talks, God says he gave us the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. Francis Chan is kind of in that prophet voice, kind of sees things. Interesting, get challenged every time. But last, last year in December, January, February, he felt like uh, the world needed to have a better understanding of what was happening in Israel. So he took uh, his little house church. That's moms, dads, granddads, grandmoms, uh, kids, grandkids. And they all went over to Israel and he taught over there. Put it all together. Ironically, a couple, about a month ago, he's like, why is this taking so long to get all this together? They couldn't get it all together. They actually released it on the day that Hamas attacked. So you just got to see this. I mean, even what he presents on, you know, again, I, for a different day, maybe I'll talk about it a little bit more in the bonus round. But there's this moment in there that he is sitting and he's talking directly to the kids in the room. So he's I mean, outside. Maybe he's, I don't even remember if he's outside the wailing wall, but he's there and he's teaching. And he's looking at teenagers, right? I can't, you can't see them. And elementary school kids. And he's just being really honest. He's like, guys, this world is creating all sorts of chaos. And for 6,000 years... There's kind of been order, and he's talking about males and females and science, not in like this disrespectful or arrogant way, not dogmatic. He's just saying what's happening in our world is, hey, kids, all around you, everybody's trying to make you, the enemy's trying to make you think that there is no truth, that truth has now changed, and it's evolving and all these things. He's like, look, either there's this book that God put together, right, 1,500 years worth of writing, more than a couple dozen authors, telling the story of God, showing how much God loves us, showing us the plan he has for us, reminding us that there is nothing you and I can do to make him love you any more or any less, just presenting all this stuff, and he's going, and many of us have been distracted by the ways of the world. And he's, not, he's not, again, not being arrogant or dogmatic, but what he's saying is, can we be confident that there really is truth? There really is truth, and he's challenging these kids to cling to the truth. Again, I would recommend... You listen to it. In fact, I even talked to Julian. It's like, hey, I think, I think our kids got to just sit and watch this and just consider it. Because it, it does make a lot of sense that there is this world that just is distraction after distraction. And I love that when you go back to the Gospel of Luke, he tells us so simply, I write these things so that you can have certainty. That is such a word we need in chaos. Uh, so, you know, certainty of the things we've been taught. And so Paul is here cheerfully and glad presenting this going, hey, the truth is on my side. And so one of the things I've been working with our students on is kind of, hey, you know, because, you know, for many of us, if you're, if you're my age or older, grew up in church, we know the song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, right? You got it, we believe it, yep, that's sure. Now when you sing that song, what you have is elementary school and teenagers and college kids going, well, can we really trust the Bible, right? Yeah, I understand you say, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, but isn't that just some made-up fairy tale book? Isn't that just another mythology? So there's just this wrestling of these things, and there's these whispers and going, is this 
something we can really trust. And so for weeks after weeks, this is kind of the talk that's been happening on Wednesday night. And it's just five simple points. And again, Paul is cheerful and glad because he knows the truth is on his side. So for all of us, not a Christian, you're a Christian, those who join us online, I just think maybe this is helpful to go, here is just truth, okay? Here's truth, but we can have confidence. Yes, our world is chaos. Yes, it's hard. But there is just, there is fundamental truth. Again, Jesus says he's the way, the truth, and life. And we'll get to that. But there is just truth. And here's the truth that I've been working through with our students so that they can have confidence. Same thing I think Francis Chan is trying to do with their kids and grandkids. It's just this, right? Here's the truth. Really the simple, okay? Take a picture of it. We'll talk about it on Tuesday. God exists. He just exists. And again, boy, it would take some mental gymnastics and a lot of movement to come up with a place that there is no God. Now, I'm not talking about maybe you don't believe in the Christian God. Maybe you think that God is like, you know, multiple gods. But to go from a place that there is a nothing to something is just a gigantic leap. God exists. God exists, right? You look outside. You see photosynthesis. You see all these things. Even when you trace history down and, you know, as far back as you can go, trace science down as far back as you can go, trace music or math as far as you can go, there just comes to this place where there's just an unknown. And in that unknown, we go, God exists. God exists, right? There is nothing and there is something. That requires supernatural work. That just does. And so God exists. Now, here's what we know if God exists. Again, not even talking about Yahweh or Jesus. If God exists, here's what we just have to say then. Miracles have to be possible. Miracles have to be possible. Because, again, I shared that with you last week. I'm I'm laying in bed as a kid crying because that's what Josh did. He cried a lot growing up, overwhelmed by this idea of eternity. Like, I mean, there is this, you know, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing his praise than when we first begun. Like, that is overwhelming, right? But to get there, to go all the way back in the past, we have to go, if there was a God and he was always there, there was no origin story, God just exists, that is a miracle. So we know if God exists, miracles have to be possible. Really, again, truth is on our side. Now, if miracles are possible, that's really interesting. Because the third thing we can say, again, the Bible loves me, Jesus loves me, this and that, for the Bible tells me so. I believe that wholeheartedly. But for a teenager, they're not so certain. But here's what I can say with 100% certainty. The Gospels are reliable. That's why I go back to Luke was a real person, a doctor turned investigative journalist. He was a real human, not folk, not myth, not any of those things. He was a real human. And these books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were written within a lifetime of Jesus' death and resurrection. In each of those, there are names mentioned, like Simon of Cyrene. We don't know about Cyrene. We don't know who Simon is. But they were written in that way so that people, when they got these notes and these words, they could have gone and checked with Simon and go, hey, did you really carry that cross? And he goes, oh my gosh, it was so heavy. In fact, that's my kid. He was right there. I mean, so there, there is more evidence that these are reliable stories than any other book ever written, right? So if the, God exists, miracles are possible, and the Gospels, again, the whole Bible is reliable, but the Gospels for sure are reliable accounts of truth. You know, if that's the case, guys, that means Jesus rose from the dead. It was awful. They tell the story of Jesus saying he was God. They tell the story of him being arrested, brutally beaten, humiliated, flogged, put on a Roman cross naked with thousands of witnesses and being murdered on that cross and then wrapped up quickly and put in a tomb that he borrowed, which is the funniest thing in the world to me. Hey, can I borrow this for a couple days? I'll leave it better than I found it, right? He borrows a tomb and then he comes back to life and reveals himself. More than 500 people. The Gospels capture this. So, here's the deal. God exists. Miracles are possible. The Gospels are reliable. Jesus, therefore, rose from the dead. And you can go back. I mean, historians will go, something crazy had to happen 2,000 years ago for that many people to be willing to give up their life. I shared it in the bonus round this past week. Lloyd and I were talking about it. The fact that Nero would literally spike Christians on human, like on spikes, and he would light them on fire. And when people would come to his debauchery, all the mess of the parties, they would walk down a walkway where Christians would be screaming and wailing. History captures this. Why were they willing to go, for the de- go to the death for this? Because they saw a resurrected Jesus. Now, here's the deal. If Jesus rose from the dead, here's what that means for us. Then he can be trusted. Because here's the deal. If someone shows up and tells you, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but through me. And then tells you that he's going to be beaten humiliated, and killed for those beliefs. And then the Son of Man, that's what he calls himself, 
Son of God. That's what he calls himself. That shows his divinity and his humanity. Is going to rise on the third day. If anyone in the history of the world can predict all that. And then give you a book that started predicting it thousands of years earlier. If anyone in the world can tell you all that stuff. And then that comes true. And then they come back to life. You can trust what they say. So if that's the case, then Jesus can be trusted. And so Paul was here giving his defense. The truth is on his side. You know, you know what he's saying? God sh- showed up in my, my jail cell. Jesus stood beside me. And he told me that I could take courage because I was going to share this news with the people in Rome. He stands there gladfully and cheerfully because the truth is on his side. Listen, the world is broken. It's crazy, and it is hard. I don't want to make light of any of those things. It is hard. I cannot imagine. Bailey and I talk about this a lot. I would not trade positions with any student in our student ministry. I wouldn't, guys. We have to have deep empathy and awareness and compassion what it must be like to be a 14 or 15 or 16 or 17-year-old right now. And we have to do it with deep compassion and love, right? I mean, it, I, I would not do it. I could not imagine. It was hard enough 20 years ago without social media Hard enough with not show, knowing which authorities to trust or which, who, who, which ones have your back and which who are manipulating you, right? I mean, it, it's hard enough. So with deep empathy and compassion, but we, but we do have good news here. The truth really is on our side. The truth is on our side. There is no other evidence that shows a resurrected Savior who paid our penalty and then came back to life. The only one. The truth is on our side. So here Paul is, and he goes, hey, they cannot prove to you what they now bring up against me. Verse 14, this is what he says. But this I confess to you. I'm sure I get this right. But this I confess to you. That according to the way, which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the laws and written in the prophets. So he's saying this. Let me just read the next verse for you real quick. Verse 15, it says this. Having a hope in God, which these, them, these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So here's what he says. Look, I, maybe, and he's going to argue in a second, maybe there is one thing they, they can have against me. I've talked about the resurrection. I believe it to be true, right? And so he's going he's gonna to point to this resurrection again. Same thing we're pointing to here. The resurrection changes everything. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, hey, if this is true, it changes everything. If not, we should just be a pitiable folks. In fact, I just wasted more of your time today. We've wasted time singing about how well it is with our soul if none of this is true. But the truth is on our side. So he's going, look, look, having hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So he's going, here's what you got to know. There is a resurrection. Now, he says something really, really interesting here. This is the first time I've I've paid attention to it in Paul's teaching. You see what he says at the end of that? Both the just and the unjust. Now, when I read this, truth is on our side. But candidly, it makes me tremble a little bit because I think this is something we lose sight of in our world that we talk about all the time that soul inside of us it will live forever that's why when you get to the end of your life you go man nobody says that just drug by it's like man it just moves around because that part of us was meant to live forever and it does that part of us it does it does so again god exists miracles are possible the gospels are reliable jesus rose from the dead and we can even go back well if god exists and we exist why is that very very simple because the God of the universe wanted you to be with him forever. If he is an eternal being, why in the world would he create humans for 80 years? He doesn't. He, was, he created them for eternity. But you see what it says there? The just and unjust, meaning every single one of us in this room. I hate this stuff, guys. I hate it. I hate talking about it. Every single one of us in our city, they'll live forever. They'll live forever. We will live forever. Every single one of those football players that I got to pray with and see on the field on Friday night, they will live forever. They'll live forever. And what hell is, is it's an eternal destination separate from life, and which is separate from God. So this is what Paul's saying. Look, we're talking about this and whether or not I should be thrown in prison or beaten, but there is a, there's a much bigger trial happening today because every single one of us will stand before God. Every single one of us will live forever some of us will be with jesus forever some will not and so there is a real way to this i don't like talking about it because i don't want to manipulate i don't want to do the emotional curse and i don't want to make you cry and, and do this out of fear but paul is going look there is an eternal situation going on here and so verse 16 he says this so 
I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Got it? Now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple, verse 19, and without any crowd or tumult. Uh, Yes, thanks, Briggs. I have the wrong translation here. But some Jews from Asia, they ought to be here before you to make an accusation. Should they have anything against me? Verse 20. Or else these men themselves say that what doing, what wrongdoing they found when I stood before them, before the council. Verse 21. Other than this one thing that I cried out while standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you. Verse 22, but Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, when Lysias the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. So Paul is giving his defense, presenting it all to him, presenting it. He's going, here's the, here's the truth, here's the truth, here's the truth. And he said, look, the only thing that maybe they can accuse me of is my talk about the resurrection. The only thing that maybe they can... They could say I did, as I did declare that there is a risen Savior, that there is a way into heaven, that we can trust that. But other than that, that's the only evidence, that there is a Jesus who loves us, a Jesus who stood beside us, a Jesus who walked on this planet, lived a perfect life, lived the life we should have lived, died the death we deserve to die, and then proved it all by coming back to life. He presents all of this, and then you see it. He's waiting and waiting and waiting, going, okay, are you going to make a decision? You're going to make a decision. In verse 22, it says this, but Felix, having a rather accurate, accurate knowledge of the way, you see that? Put them off saying, when Lysias the Tribune comes down, I will decide your case. So he literally goes, hey, 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 yep, 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 yep. I understand what you're talking about. I understand the way. And then he just pushes it off and goes, yep, I'm not going to make a decision. I'm not going to make a decision. And you go, why? Why would he not make a decision? Why would he not make a decision? Why would he not in that moment go, yes, 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 yes. I believe there is the way. I believe it, right? Paul, it's evidence. There is this way. Hey, guys, guys, as you see this, this guy is testifying to this way. And he goes, no, nope, can't make the decision. Can't make the decision. And I go, well, why? And it's actually pretty simple. It's actually the same thing all of us do. It's actually what drives most of our life. Fear. Fear. So you got this guy who's going, can I say this? Can we trust this? What if I say it? What are these guys going to do? Are they going to beat me up? Are they going to revolt? Am I going to lose my job? Right? There's this, all this panic and hedging because in this moment, he can make a decision and go, yep, there's a way. Hey, guys, there's a way. Hey, there is the way. And so what was referred to in Christianity was the way, meaning Jesus reminded us again that he's the way, the truth, and life. No one gets to the Father. And so Paul was just following that way. And so the way, way really, really is pretty simple. It's going, this is the direction by how you get there. And I love this verse, John 14, 6. So what Jesus is doing is he just told all the disciples that he's going to leave them. Okay? John 14, it begins this way, or 13. He's going, hey, guys, I'm going back to the Father, but that's good news because you're going to get my spirit. Right? And they start freaking out, and they go, no, 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 Stay with us. Stay with us. Stay with us. No, stay with us. You are our Savior. Just like Paul. like, no, 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 stay beside me. He's going, no, no, the good news is if I leave, then all of you get me in the form of the spirit. And they're still panicked. And he says, John 14, verse 1, he says this. Hey, guys, don't let your hearts be troubled. See that? He's like peering in. He's going, don't let your hearts be troubled. And he goes, believe in God. Believe also in me. And then he says, in my Father's house are many, many rooms. Hey, hey there is a, there's an eternal destination for the just. By the way, there's no room for the unjust. In my Father's house are many rooms. And if it weren't so, I wouldn't have told you. And he says this, and I'm going to prepare a place for you, that where I am you may be also. Yeah, and he's going, the whole goal of the gospel, the whole goal of the Bible is for you and I to be with Jesus forever. Hey, I'm going to prepare a place that where, that where you are, that where I am, you can be also. And Thomas, one of Jesus' disciples, the same one who wanted to look at his scars in you know, the post-resurrection when Jesus reveals himself, he basically says this. He goes, we don't know how to get there. We don't know how to get there, right? We don't know how to get there. And so when people even talk about this passage, they're going, Jesus is being so dogmatic and arrogant. No, he's not. He's just being specific. All of us like clear direction. All of us like them. And so Jesus looks at Thomas, and he says very matter-of-factly, I am that way. I am that truth. I am that life. I am the only way by which you get to the Father. So when, when 
Paul is talking about this way. Felix even says, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way. See that? Luke's going, this guy even knows it. This guy even knows it. It's not that he doesn't know it. You see that? It's not that he doesn't know it. It's not that for many of us that we don't know that there actually is a way, that there really is a Savior. It's not that deep in our gut we don't know it. So if we know it, then why don't we follow it? And here's what we do. We go, ah, we'll deal with it later. Now here's what you got to understand. And you know this as a parent. Delayed obedience is still disobedience. And indecision is still a decision. Just the wrong one, right? And so what he does, because he doesn't have the courage in that moment to lean all the way in, which is all faith is, it's leaning all the way in on Jesus, right? It's trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him, meaning putting all your faith in it. He doesn't do that. Instead, he just delays it and makes the, the wrong decision. And he goes, I'm going to let someone else do it. When Lysias, the tribune, comes down, I will decide your case then. Now, verse 23, watch this. Verse 23, then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody but have some liberty and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. So this is his concession. You see this? He goes, I can't make the decision. I'm not leaning in. I'm not going to declare that, that he's the way. I'm not going to have that courage. I'm just going to delay it. But hey, 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 try to, try to appease everyone and to understand that the truth is really on Paul's side. He goes, hey, yeah, 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 yeah. You can, you're going to have to stay in my custody. But you see what it says there? Uh, that he can have some liberty. That means maybe not in chains. And his friends should be prevented. None of his friends should be prevented uh, from attending to his needs. This is pretty interesting. Because what history will tell us, most scholars believe that Luke, this writing that we're reading here in Acts, was actually written because Luke was able to hang out in Caesarea with Paul. So here they are writing some of this. And so Paul's going to write some stuff from Caesarea. So he's going to be in captivity, but it's not going to be that bad. It's pretty common in 2,000 years ago that it would have been uh, friends and family who would have provided the food to those who were in captivity. It wasn't like they had like a, a jail cafeteria. But so he goes, nope, not going to make the decision, but I am going to give him some freedom. And so that's where you find Paul, and he just goes, man, Felix, you just miss it. And you can tell that something's stirring in him, because watch what happens in verse 24. See what happens next? After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, got it, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him, uh, sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. So Drusilla and Felix asked for Paul to come, okay? This is Drusilla. She's got fancy hair there. Well, history tells us about Drusilla. She's probably about 20 at this time, really, really pretty. In fact, uh, Felix has seduced her, stole her from a different husband, and she, you'll see it in Acts 25, was actually a, a relative, maybe even a sister of Herod Agrippa. I mean, so she had some influence and authority, but her background was Jewish, so she knew some about Judaism. And so he hears this and goes, hey, would you get Paul to come tell us a little more? I don't know why he's doing it. I don't know if he, he's like, man, Paul made a big deal. My wife wants to meet him. I don't know if he's really, really considering whether to lean all the way in. We don't really know, but we just know that he asked Paul to come. And you see what he's speaking about? Faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 25. And he, and as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment. Now watch what happens. Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. See that? See it? So he's asking about all the stuff. And all of a sudden, Paul starts preaching at him. And he says three things. Really a cute little three-point sermon, actually. The first thing he says is righteousness, about righteousness. And then he says it about self-control. Then he says it about judgment. And this is going to get Felix out of fear, who's going to respond and say, stop, stop talking about it. And you go, well, what was he talking about? Really, really important. Again, truth is on our side, but it's only on our side because of Jesus. So that first thing is righteousness. And so he would have talked to Felix and Drusilla about their standing before God. That's what righteousness means, their right standing. And so he probably would have said something like this. Hey, do you think on your own you can appease God? Do you think your behavior is good enough, Drusilla? Do you think your behavior is good enough, Felix, that you can appease God and make God happy with you? Do you think you can do that? No, let's just take a grade at your life, look at all this stuff, like, what do you think? Do you think you have earned salvation before a perfect and holy God? Never cussed, never gotten drunk, never gossiped, never lied, 
never lusted. So he would have just been very honest with them and go, okay, let's, let's just see. Let's grade ourselves on a scale of 1 to 10. How good are you? By the way, Felix, it requires a 10 out of 10 for you to get on the kingdom on your, on your own. And then he would have talked about the second one because this makes sense. I would have, it would have made sense to me. Hey, okay, let's just be honest. Can we just be honest for a second? We're not as good as we pretend to be. None of us are as good as we pretend to be. None of us. I'm telling you, if all my thoughts made it on this screen behind me, one at a time, y'all would start walking out while I'm preaching. Right? And that's why I think, man, we got a long way to go as a church to be honest with one another. And so he's going, hey, let's just be honest. Are you that good? And then let's be honest. Think about these things. And Paul's going to write about this in Romans. He's going, how many times have you said you were going to change and then didn't? Right? How many times have you gone, I, I'm, from now on, I'll never drink, I'll never look at that, I'll never say that. How many of those weird promises have you made? And then you've realized, the very things I'm trying to do, I can't do, and the things I don't want to do, I end up doing. And he just goes, look, the, you understand, we don't have enough self-control. The reason we're not righteous is because we're not good anyway. Right? And so he just would have invited Drusilla and Felix to consider this and go, okay, we're, we don't stand right before God, but do you think you could change your behavior now? If it just started over fresh today, that you could do it right now. In other words, hey, Felix, Drusilla, would you like for God to grade your life on your own? Would you like to determine your standing before a perfect and holy God by your behavior in the past or even your behavior in the future? You see that word self-control there. Actually, it's really interesting in the scriptures. Let me read it to you. The word self-control, as it shows up here, literally means uh, proceeding out from within oneself, but not by oneself. The self-control Paul's talking about is a self-control that's a fruit of the Spirit as the result of what the Spirit does for us. And so he would have talked about, hey, in our own, we don't stand right before God. But there is a way for us to start living the life God wants. But it's not you doing it. It's God inside you. You see the third one is? Hey, let's talk about righteousness. Let's talk about self-control. And let's talk about the third one, judgment. Let's talk about how we stand before a perfect God. Again, he's already talked about the unjust and the just, and so he is saying every single one of us at some point will stand before God and give an account in our life. And I used to think about that and go, well, I'm sure that's just a brief little moment, right? Again, not trying to scare you, but a brief little moment where I just show up and talk for a few minutes. God gives me a high five, and I'm on my way. But if a thousand years is the same as a minute, and a minute is the same as a thousand years in heaven, is that possible? That means that every single human gets to sit down on a couch with a God of the universe and watch their whole life play before him. Could you imagine oh, what I meant there, God, was, could you imagine, like, the, again, as Christ followers, Jesus goes, nope, I'm covering that. But for, for those who aren't, to have to give that account, so he's explaining these things to Felix and Drusilla. So you can imagine that moment, thinking about having to give an account. Remember, this is the guy who's massacred thousands of Jews. This is the guy who seduced his wife and stole her from another man. He's hearing these things, and you can imagine, he just goes, shut up, shut up, I can't take any more. And he gets alarmed. In verse 26, it says this. At the same time, he had just hoped that money would be given uh, him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. Nope, go away. Come back. Hey, maybe this time I, he'll bribe me and I'll let him go. Nope, go away. Come back. Maybe this time I'll bribe you. So you just see this pattern over and over again, so close and yet so far away. Verse 27, when two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. So two years of this, two years, two years. He keeps calling Paul, keep hoping he would be... Um, bribed. Paul keeps sharing with him the truth and he keeps turning in a way. And I just would go, how many times does it have to happen for us? Like at what point, and again, no fear mongering, just at what point is this the day where you finally go, look, I'm all the way in. I'm all the way in. Jesus, the truth is on our side and so why would I go any other direction but lean all the way in? And so the way we talk about that, guys, really, really simple, is just called surrender, right? At what point do we finally surrender? When I think about surrender, it's a terrible analogy, but what I think about is um, another, another kind of show or movie I like is the, the ones with the negotiators. I don't know, I'm just really intrigued by the negotiators who are talking to the bad guy, the terrorist, trying to calm him down. But you know, you've seen it, you know, go from Die Hard, any of those movies where there is bad guys and they are, they're holding and they're asking for, you know, their demands to be met and this negotiator's talking to them. And then, but I just imagine eventually the, the negotiator says, hey, look, we have we have snipers on every single building. We have 45 red dots on you. If you don't surrender now, it will not go well for you, 
right? It's just that kind of idea that finally, and so when I think about surrender, surrender literally means that you just finally throw your hands up and go, there is no other option that works. When I think about surrender, I think about hands going up, and, every, and I go, I think when I think about hands going up, right, like when we sing or worship, there's only a couple of reasons your hands would go up. One would be you're surrendering. Hey, I have nothing good left. It will not go well for me unless I just walk out of this building, lay down my weapons, and just lean all the way in, surrender. Or maybe the next one is like um, when, when I would come home, when my kids were little, they would stick their hands up, right? Why? Because they wanted me to pick them up, right? So they'd pick me up. And the only other reason I could uh, think that you would surrender is if you have a question, right? Or a hand to go up. We've got a question. And so you raise your hand so that you have your question answered. Or the final one is because you're just ready to volunteer, right? And so there's just something about this posture of finally going, God, either I'm giving it all up because it hasn't worked well for me, or God, I just would really like for you to pick me up. God, I got some questions, and I think you're the only one who can answer it. Or God, I am ready to lean all the way in. And so the question is, how much more truth do you need? If the truth is on our side, and there is evidence everywhere, how much more truth do we absolutely need to finally surrender? And I don't know the answer for that for you. But here's what I will tell you. Paul tells us on the night that Jesus was betrayed, that same night he would have told him that he's the way, the truth, and life, he did something so spectacular. And he took some bread and he broke it. And the reason he broke it, and he told him this, that this is his body that's given for them. In other words, hey, I lived a perfectly righteous life. I lived a perfectly righteous life on my own. I did all the work. Did it all. Like, and broke the bread and started handing out to him and going, this is my body that's given for you. In other words, hey, hey, it is about judgment. And I am going to be judged for everyone on this planet's behavior. And all they have to do is receive my covering. And he would have passed out. And he goes, this is my body. Would have broken it, handed it out, and given it to him. And going, hey, as often as you receive this, do this to remember it to me. And then he would have taken some wine. And for us here, guys, if you want to know, this is just juice, just trying to honor our brothers and sisters that struggle with any kind of alcohol issues. And uh, he would have taken the wine and he poured it out. And he would have gone, this is my blood that's shared for you. In other words, look, I lived the life you should have lived. And then I died the death you deserved to die. And then I'm standing before a righteous and perfect God and being judged on your behalf. And so he says, drink this, receive it. Receive it. And as often as you receive it, you do it in remembrance to me. And one of the things I love about that word remembrance is that word remembrance doesn't just mean think about, consider, reflect on. It literally means to apply something that happened in the past directly to your present. In other words, he goes, hey, guys, as often as you do this, there are going to be times where you're going to look and go, yep, I'm not righteous. Yep, I don't have self-control. Yep, I deserve the wrath of an angry God or a jealous God. But in that moment, you can remind yourself that I was righteous. That's Jesus talking. I did do it right. I did pay the price. So your only decision that you have to make is, do you want to be judged on your merit and performance? Or do you want to be judged on mine, Jesus's? merit or performance and what communion is it is a reminder that we are being judged on god's merit and god's performance that he did all the work the only part we do is we receive it and so what posture do we have when we receive it surrender we just go god it's all yours I want to trust you. I'm going to do my best, God. And then would your spirit come in me and give me self-control? Would your spirit come in me and give me hope and courage? Would your spirit come in me and cast out that fear? And so for just a few moments, just want you to consider what it would take for you to finally just relinquish control and go, God, it's all yours. So what's going to happen is the choir is going to come up. And they're going to lead us in a really beautiful, you'll recognize it, almost 200-year-old song maybe 150, 175 years. And the song is, I Surrender All. And while they sing this, the question for you is, are you ready? Are you ready to kind of surrender it all, to go, God, I, I, I want to be judged because the truth is on my side on your performance. And then if so, then you go, God, I just want to receive this. And then when I'm going to come back up when they finish and just remind us what communion is for us and how and why you should partake in it, maybe for the first time. So, hey, choir, if you want to come, prepare. I'm going to pray for us. And then... Um,